got a good number with us tonight, and we are certainly glad that you are here once again with us this evening. Uh, we had a little meeting just uh, a few moments ago, and we talked a little bit about our Vacation Bible School. I'm excited. Uh, as Marion was uh, praying um, and uh, did a wonderful job in his prayer, I thought about the times that I've heard Marion speak at the nursing home, and I was reminded that we haven't done that in a long time because of COVID and all of that, and it's things like that that I miss, and uh, things that we sort of took for granted that we haven't been able to do. And so maybe the Vacation Bible School, the meeting coming up this week, and then the Vacation Bible School and all of these regular events uh, can get us back where, uh, where we are comfortable being and, and doing the work that we're so used to doing on a regular basis. So we're talking about, uh, once again, March Madness... But from a spiritual standpoint, I think uh, my, my oldest son told me we, we watched Illinois get beat uh, t earlier today just before we had lunch with the family. And they were a number one seed. Uh, and I believe they were the second most chosen to win it all on people's brackets. And they got beat. And uh, so now they're gone and, you know, everybody's bracket is, is even more busted than it was when this day began. But again, we're talking for our purposes today about spiritual battles that take place inside of each one of us. Uh, and we talked about lust and how we must battle lust with self-control, with temperance. We talked about discouragement and how we battle discouragement with confidence. And for each of those, we had a case study. And, and we dove into Joseph and his relationship with Potiphar and the temptation placed in front of him by Potiphar's wife and how he overcame lust. Well, then we moved on to talk about Paul on the ship as he was headed to Rome and how the crew failed to take his inspired advice and the whole crew and ship suffered as a result. But they were all saved thanks to eventually heeding his advice and following His confidence. And so now we're going to move on to continue talking about mortal madness. That is, the battle that is within us spiritually every day. And we'll look at two more foes that you and I face in our spiritual lives every day. And everybody in the world faces these. And we begin with distraction. Is it safe to say that we're the most distracted generation in the history of the world? I think it is. 90% of teachers who were polled in a recent survey believed that their students were extremely distracted because of the cell phones and the devices that they had. 90% thought it was an extreme problem with their students. And certainly, I think we can see that it is. And I wish I could say that it's just this pesky generation of kids that it's a problem with. But look at us, at their parents... Look even at their grandparents and how often we use and how devoted we often are to our devices, to our electronics, to our cell phones, to our social media. But we're distracted. But distraction spiritually is one of the biggest foes that faces us, one of our greatest adversaries. In Colossians 3 and verse 2, Paul says, "...set your affections on things above." not on the things on this earth. Set your affections. And the phrase set your affection means to mind or to entertain, to be disposed to, to interest oneself in. And so what Paul is saying is your focus, your interest, your mental power needs to be devoted to spiritual things. In Romans 8 and verse 5, Paul says, For they that are of the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. And so that's a big determining factor as to whether or not we're faithful to God. Where is my brain power most spent? Is it spent on things on this earth? Or is it spent on things above? We all struggle from one time to another with distraction. When does distraction occur? Uh, I looked at all of the times in which that, that phrase translated, set your affections, uh, occurs in the New Testament. It shows up uh, a good number of times, and it's not always translated exactly that way. 
Uh, but I want you to look at some of the times when distraction occurs. Number one, when we don't grow. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1. And I find it interesting that we've referenced in this morning's sermon and now tonight, 2 Peter chapter 1 a number of times. But I want you to look at verse 8. After those Christian graces have ended, that list of qualities that we all are to possess... He says in verse 8, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But then listen how he describes it in verse 9, if you lack these things. But he that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. One who is blind, one whose focus cannot be put on spiritual things. They, they, they're not focusing on the right things. And why? Because in this context, they do not grow. You know, the younger we are, it seems, the shorter our attention spans are. Uh, infants aren't able to endure long-term Things. They're just, they're, they're, their attention spans aren't designed for it. And there's nothing more frightening than watching these infant television shows that are catered to the short attention spans of these very small children. And they cater to it very well. And there used to be this Baby Einstein franchise that came out many years ago when, when Jordan was an infant. And you watch that as an adult and... And it's very odd because it's just a, like it might be a monkey banging the drums and then it does that for a few seconds and then it's something else and it's something else and then it does this and that. But it's, a, it's appealing to the short attention spans of the young. Well, I feel like spiritually if we do not grow properly, then we have the same difficulty. A stunted attention span spiritually. And it's when our attention span spiritually isn't what it ought to be, that's when we get led away and distracted from the things that we ought to be focused on. But distraction also occurs when we are focused on self. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus has asked Peter who men say that He the Son of Man is. He asks all the disciples that. Peter responds. And then in verse 21, pick up in Matthew 16. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto His disciples how that He must go into Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and raised again the third day. Then Peter took Him and began to rebuke Him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. I want to say two things before I continue. Number one, as I was reading that, I heard in the background pages flip. That's a wonderful sound. A wonderful sound to hear pages flip. So many times though today we have digital Bibles and some of you are scrolling through. I wish they would make a sound for that where your pages would sound like they were flipping as you were going through your Bibles. But what a sound that is. But I want you to notice what we just read. Jesus said, I've got to, to go into Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die and be raised the third day. And Peter said, it will not happen to you like that. Obviously, Peter hasn't been paying attention. And I want you to notice what Jesus responds in verse 23. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. And then this statement is made, For you savor not the things that be of God. That phrase, you savor not is the same that's translated set your affections on in Colossians 3.2. Your mind isn't on the right things, Peter. That's what Jesus is telling him. You don't savor the things that are of God, but those that are of men. You're focused on the wrong things. And Peter's problem was a problem of focus. It was a problem of distraction. When Peter was focused... He was one of the, the greatest disciples that Jesus could hope for. But when he was distracted, well, it was so much different. And isn't it the same for you and me? Distraction occurs when we don't grow, when we're focused on self. And when we allow anything, literally anything, to take our focus off of God where it needs to be. Go to Matthew chapter 13. And here Jesus begins to teach in parables. Matthew chapter 13. And possibly the most famous parable, one of my favorites, the parable of the soils, is mentioned here in Matthew chapter 13. And he, he begins to 
interpret this parable beginning in verse 18. He says, Hear you therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, understands it not, then comes the wicked one, catches it away, which was sown in his heart. And this is he which receives seed by the wayside. That's verse 19. Verse 20. But he that received the seed in the stony places, the same as he that hears the word, and anon, or immediately with joy, he receives it. Yet he has not rooted himself, but he endureth for a little while. Then when tribulation and persecution arises because of the word, by and by he's offended. By the way, those are the discouraged ones that we talked about this morning. But now I want you to notice next, verse 22. He also that received seed among the thorns is he that hears the word. And notice what, what it says. And the care of this world. That word care means distractions. The distractions of this world, he says. And the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. And he becomes unfruitful. In Mark's account of that same parable, in Mark 4 and verse 19, it says, the distractions of other things entering in. See, when other things shoulder their way into our lives, they have the tendency to distract us, to take our focus away from God. And it can be good things. It can be work, which is not a bad thing. It can be family, which is not a bad thing. It can be spouses, or it can be boyfriends or girlfriends, or, or whatever obligations we have can, can soak into our lives, and they can distract us from what ought to be our main and primary focus. And distraction is one of the greatest enemies that you and I have. How do we overcome distraction? Well, number one, we've got to be intentional. You've got to make a, a, a concerted effort to keep your focus. Colossians 3. Set your affections on things above. Verse 1 says, seek those things which are above. It doesn't happen on accident. It's something that is purposed. I purpose that I'm going to continue to focus on God because there's so many things that can distract us. It's something we do intentionally. We do it on purpose. Any of you husbands ever been so overcome with your daily lives that you forget an anniversary or a holiday or a birthday and you let it just slip right by. Well, what happened? Well, you were distracted, right? And so now moving forward, you've got to make a more concerted effort. It's got to be intentional. Uh, for many of us, it just doesn't come naturally to remember those occasions, right? Sometimes I have to ask Danielle how old I am because I forget whether I've already had my birthday or not. And you think I'm joking, but that's true. My birthday is April 4th. Write that down. On April 4th, I might very well forget that it's my birthday. So if I forget my birthday, do you think it's likely I might on some occasion forget hers? I try not to. But you see, it's got to be intentional, right? We've got to say, I'm determined that I'm going to keep these things on the forefront of my mind because it might not come as easy sometimes as it does others. It must be, number one, intentional. Number two, we have to be selective. We're, we've got to say there are things that will not come into my life. Philippians 4 and verse 8, Whatsoever things are honest, lovely, good report, if there are any virtue, any praise, what? Think on these things. Make sure that you are selective about what you allow into your brain and what you allow into your life. We live in a world today that teaches us, you know, that, that when it comes to music and movies, that anything goes. And the things that our children consume, if we are not careful, are very detrimental to them spiritually. And we've got and the things that we consume can be very detrimental to us spiritually. And we need to be certain when it comes to our focus that the things we're focused on are things that can lift us up and build us up instead of things that can tear us down and take us away from God. And, and number three, we've got to be prayerful. Philippians 4 and verse 6, Be anxious for nothing. But what's the remedy for that? In everything with prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. If we find ourselves being so distracted, so taken away from all of the other things in life, prayer is a key component of maintaining our focus and our devotion to God. 
What about that case study? I want you to go with me to Luke chapter 10. And I love Martha. Martha's a great lady. And Jesus loved Martha. In fact, there weren't too many people that Jesus loved from a human standpoint more than Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. Whenever Jesus came into the region of Jerusalem, He would go to their home. And He would stay there and He would dwell with them. And He was, he was very close with them. And I want you to look at an exchange that takes place near the end of Luke chapter 10 about Mary and Martha. Verse 38. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house and she had a sister called Mary which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. And what you'll learn is that there couldn't be too, too many sisters any more different than Mary and Martha. And I don't know if you've experienced this with your own siblings or with your own children. You can have two children and they could be completely night and day different from one another. And Mary and Martha are night and day different. So Mary, in verse 39, is sitting at Jesus' feet and hearing His words. But Martha was cumbered about with much serving. She was cumbered. That word cumbered means to be dragged around or distracted by care. Martha was being dragged around by her own distractions. Now the things she was distracted by weren't necessarily bad things. What's she doing? But Martha was cumbered about much serving. You know this woman, don't you? You go to their home, would you like something to drink? Would you like some pie? Would you like me to fix you a five-course meal? Would you like me to wash and press your clothes? Would you like me to go make, you know, they, they, they just cannot help but serve. And they serve everybody all the time. And you know those people. Some of them are your grandparents or your mothers or whatever the case might be. And they are servants at heart. And they're always moving around seeing who they can serve. And so this woman was cumbered about, distracted through much serving. And she came to him and she said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Now that's, that's classic sibling rivalry if we've ever seen it, isn't it? One sibling tattling on the other because they left her to do all the work. And if you have brothers and sisters, you know exactly what that's like. So she goes to Jesus and she says, Jesus, I'm serving everybody and my sister is sitting here doing nothing. And she says, bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, you're right. Mary needs to get up and do work. That's what she wanted him to say, but that's not what he said. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about Many things. The word careful is the same word in Philippians 4. Be careful for nothing. It's, it's, it's anxiety. Be anxious for nothing, Philippians 4 tells us. Well, you're anxious and you're troubled or disturbed about many things. You see, what he says is inwardly you're in turmoil and outwardly you're in turmoil because you're distracted by things that aren't nearly as important as the one thing that Mary is doing right now. If you had asked Martha, Martha would have said, no, I'm focused on the things I need to be focused on. But Jesus said, your focus is wrong. And so what did He say moving forward? He says again in verse 41, you're careful and troubled about many things. The text literally says a whole bunch, a lot, much. You've got a lot of anxieties and a lot of troubles. But one thing is needful. There's really only one thing you should have been focused on. Jesus, the Son of God, is in your home. And that should have been your focus. And Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Doesn't Martha represent many of us? Cumbered by the things of this life, the things of this world, their responsibilities, their obligations, their services, and their duties and neglecting the one thing that's needful, sitting at the feet of Christ. Mary was overcome, or Martha rather, was overcome by distraction. So we see distraction, and the, the key to overcoming distraction is focus on the Savior. 
And as you think about our final battle, this battle really can encompass all the others. It's the battle with worldliness. John said it very simply, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Worldliness is a battle that every one of us faces. We have an obligation to be in the world, but not of the world. And it's a struggle that you and I deal with every single day. Worldliness. See, worldliness is the root of all of these other struggles that we deal with. Worldliness is connected to all of the other foes and adversaries that we face every day. What is lust but a desire for the things of the world? You see, John goes on to say, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world... And then he lists three categories of things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world is characterized by lust. And it's that lust and that desire that can overcome us if we're not careful. What is discouragement but this feeling that the world is not returning the love that we've been giving it. I pour all of my time into work, but I don't get the promotion. I pour all of my time into this, but I don't get that. And so discouragement often can be the result of worldliness, distraction. Well, that comes from loving the world, doesn't it? When I place things categorically above God then I become distracted. Worldliness is the root of all of our other adversaries that we've noticed. So how do we overcome worldliness? What's the opposite of worldliness? Godliness. We talked about godliness last year when we went through the fruits of the Spirit. Godliness was among the fruits of the Spirit. It's among the Christian graces of 2 Peter 1 as well. Godliness is our recognition of our dependence on God. And wouldn't that fix everything? I'm dependent upon God, so why should I be discouraged when He is my portion and my strength? I am dependent upon God and therefore no temptation can affect me because I stand firm in Him. I am dependent upon God. And therefore, none of these things can affect me and take my focus away from God because I'm dependent upon Him. Godliness. Godliness is connected to contentment. 1 Timothy 6 it gives a discussion of worldliness as it relates to monetary things. And so often we can get caught up in the things of this world physically, financially, materially. And look what he says in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 5. He says, Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. But then he says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. I am dependent upon God and I have everything that I need because of Him. That's the key. But it's connected to genuineness as well. Did you know there can be fake godliness? 2 Timothy 3 and verse 5, he says, "...having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away." Those who claim godliness, but in reality they're worldly. But true godliness says, I am dependent on God. We are at war. But if we are going to be faithful to God, we must fight the battle against all things worldly. We are in the world, but not of the world. We must redirect our lusts to things that are positive. We must hold fast our confidence, which has great recompense of reward. We must focus on God and set our affections on Him. We must avoid the pitfalls of the world. I'd like you to turn to Hebrews chapter 11 and let's notice a character uh, who exemplifies that and really a number of characters who exemplify that. Let's look at one last case study. Go to Hebrews chapter 11 and pick up with me in verse 8. By faith, Abraham, 
When he was called to go out into a place which he should afterwards receive for an inheritance obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith... He sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. And now look at verse 10. For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. And then pick up in verse 13 and let's see the conclusion. These all died in faith. Abel, Noah, Abraham. And notice what he says. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Look, our life isn't really about this earth. And these folks in the, Hebrew, in the hall of faith, they recognized that this world was not their home. In verse 14, For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of the country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better country that is a heavenly. See, and what separates those in the hall of faith from everyone else is their understanding that they were fighting a battle on this earth and that the victory wouldn't take place here, but in heaven. And dear friends, that's the lesson that you and I can learn as well. You see, if we look at the ultimate end of all of these battles that we fight, then we come to the same conclusion this evening that we came to this morning. God will win. Let's look at a different passage to underscore that this evening. Pick up with me in 1 Corinthians 15, 54. Paul has talked about the resurrection, and in verse 54, So when then this, in, this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortality shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying which is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We will win. If there's a battle you're facing, if you face it with God, you will win. If there is a temptation with which you are struggling, if you stand firm on the Word of God, you will win. If you focus on heaven as your home, there's nothing in this life that can overtake you. Tonight, which side are you on? God will win. Satan will lose. This world will be destroyed, and it is not our home. If you need to obey the gospel tonight, Believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith, and be baptized. <coughs> but maybe tonight you are a Christian. Maybe you are facing the battles of life, and maybe at this moment you're losing. It's never too late. As long as there is breath in your body, as long as there is life, there is an opportunity. Tonight, if you need to come back to God, I invite you to do it. Obey the gospel and be restored as together we stand and sing. <clears throat>